He was also farming until about 25 minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Nate. Latrice Tatsy drove four and a half hours from Badger Creek. She is, in my mind, a superwoman, incredibly brilliant woman, mother of three super cool kids. She highlighted in Liz Carlisle's most recent book, um, Healing Grounds, if you've read that. She is the star in the intro. Latrice is a soil scientist working with the nonprofit Public, sorry, Pecani Lodge Health Institute as the cultural science lead and intern supervisor for their regenerative grazing initiative. Her master's research at MSU focused on how cattle and bison influence soil health. Latrice works with cattle ranchers on the Blackfeet Nation where she lives, as well as the tribal bison herd. She lives and ranches on the land where she grew up on Badger, Badger Creek, which flows out of the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Tim Seipel, an incorrigible academic. <laughs> yeah. Keep going, Emily. He is a plant ecology professor at MSU. His research is broadly focused on ecology and evolution that impacts plant interactions, species distribution, and ecosystem function. He is also the cropland weed specialist for MSU Extension Service a job that takes him to the far reaches of rural Montana, where he collaborates with farmers to innovate weed and ecology management and organic cropping systems. So our, my first set of questions is gonna focus on early mentorship that they experienced. So Latrice, you have told me about sitting in the saddle behind your dad as a young child, maybe you were three, um, looking for cows out in Badger Creek. You've also mentioned learning from your uncles and your grandmother about traditional uses of the land. I would love to know more about how these early mentors influenced your work today. Having my mentors be my family was kind of my roadmap to, to life. I, where I grew up on our family ranch, my dad was the main caretaker of our operation while my grandma worked full time and my mom was in school and so I threw a fit not to go to kindy, or preschool, I cried, and my dad was like, she wins, she does not need to go to preschool. And so I was like back, bouncing on back of a horse, learning my ABCs, learning how to count, um, learning how to spell my name, learning like little basic math things. While doing that, I, we were riding, looking at buffalo jumps, looking at rock cairns, looking at all these things, and I didn't realize the importance of that until I got older. And when I started to realize what I wanted to do, I was like, it's all outdoors. My mother passed away from cancer when I was 13, and so my dad had a really hard time, um, excuse me, celebrating holidays. So he would always take me in the mountains, and we would go hunting all the time. So being outdoors was like my, it healed me. It, um, being in the mountains, is what I call heaven. It's how I connect to my past. It's how I connect to my present and how I connect to my future. So having that type of upbringing gave me a greater impact in the importance of, of outdoors because we were going hunting and I, would, I remember being on top of that mountain and just getting hit with snow and like, why are we up here? It's so cold. Like, I can't even see the bottom. We're like, you know, 6,500 feet up. And, you know, you guys are all cool rock climbers. And I was like, the only time I'm going up a mountain is with a horse is packing me. <laughs> and, um, but, I, you know, I know what, when you, you guys go to the mountains and when you're tied to it, because that was one of the first times I learned I wanted to be a scientist. I was riding with my dad. We were going into the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and these guys were be bopping around on a four-wheeler, and they had all this testing equipment. And I was like, Dad, you know, what are they doing? He's like, first of all, they shouldn't be on here in four-wheelers or, like, messing up our trails. And I was like, no, but what are they doing? So we sat on top of that mountain, and we watched them. We watched them take water samples and all that. I was like, Dad, that's so, that's so cool. Like, I want to do things like that when I'm older, like that, you know? And so for me being introduced to it at a young age, but also having that outdoor experience and understanding how important those relationships are to land in place was really my, 
my road map and so if it wasn't for my family um, taking me to the Bob Marshall Wilderness, my dad and my uncles fighting to end the leases for um, the Badger to Medicine area, you know, I wouldn't have the background I do because growing up we would go up to those areas, we would find cultural sites. So I was very fortunate to see where our ancestors had teepee rings, see where they fasted. And so knowing that cultural relationship to the land that our people had has always been how I've been able to keep going. And it's been my mentorship through my family that's helped um, guide me in the work that I'm doing and I continue to do. And you know, if it wasn't for them doing that, teaching me at such a young age, I don't think I would have really understood the importance of mentorship and carried it on the way I do today. So that's my answer. So thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Tim, you grew up in Ohio and visiting your dad's family in his German hometown. You've told me that that experience makes you comfortable when you visit rural Montana, all the way from Alzada to the Yak. <laughs> <laughs> that was my answer today. Um, yeah, I had a connection to food and agriculture and stuff, so I realized at an early age, actually there's a picture of me at like four years old stuffing the sausage maker. Um, and so I did hang out a lot in a lot in places, but in different places around the world and thought about what food kind of meant. We always had a big garden when I was a kid and actually common lambs quarters is horrible and I might remember my mom cursing about it. Um, and so I kind of got into agriculture, but I kind of, I was in ecology. I first studied, like if my parents asked me when I was younger, what do you do for a living? I count plants and do math was always sort of my rough joke. And I worked in Alpine Ecology first, actually. I did vegetation surveys in the Alpine, around Cook City, Impact, all these things. But agriculture actually always brought me back, and part of it was some of the connections that I had with just people or going places in the world. Like, if you went to the Cordillera Blanca in Peru and you think about what the Quechua, what their native food system was, and that always fascinated me. Um, and so I really got back and I get to have this really cool job where I get to go out and work with all the awesome agricultural producers across the state of Montana. And it's like, yeah, this is kind of a different world, but my worlds are colliding here. Usually we're talking to ag producers, but it does come back. Mary Stein, actually, I led um, agroecology study abroad trips to Morocco with SFBF students. We're actually linked back to Chris and Chloe Erickson and we would go and we and we work on the agroecology system there and we'd be down like working with local people engaged with them and those were always like the strongest like some of the best connections we made um, and so yeah that's what kind of inspired me Nate your family moved from Chicago to Bighorn Wyoming in the 1950s your grandfather was gathering oral history from members of the Cheyenne tribe. You grew up in Belgrade, and at age nine, with your seven-year-old brother, raised a steer for 4-H. At age 12, you landed a junior ag loan from the state to buy three pregnant cows in a trailer four years before you could drive? <laughs> that said trailer. Um, you said that for you, finding mem mentors was really a right place, right time situation. As you were entering farming, you found some really incredible people who helped you along the way. Tell us about those early experiences and how they influence your work today. I think this is on? Yeah, yeah. all right. Um, so my, none of my family comes from farming. Uh, my mom got out of Chicago as fast as she could and started working on ranches around the state um, and around Wyoming, but um, I, get to be the first one in my family to be a professional farmer who actually makes all of my living from farming and ranching. And that's only because I just happened to luck on this really incredible group of folks who are doing things just a little bit differently. And so when I was uh, just about nine, my mom started buying some chicken feed from these two ladies uh, up in Helena who had a certified organic chicken feed mill. Um, and it was my first chance to go up and talk to people about what this thing organic is 
and what it means and what it does. It's also my first exposure to, um, and it was a little bit early for me to really register what it, what it meant, but to a same-sex couple who are thriving in agriculture and making it in a community that really loves and supports them. Um, looking at the opportunities thereafter um, where we were able to have lots of conversations, me and these two, two farmers up in Helena, and, uh, and they just gave so much time and energy to this kid who wouldn't stop calling and asking them questions. Like, how do you fill out the paperwork? And how do you, uh, like, what are these rules? And can I buy a little organic hay from you? Because I realize I need that for my cows to be certified organic. Um, and they were so giving. They never, every single time I called, they always picked up the phone. And even if it was a really silly question, they always answered it and took me very seriously. Um, and that was my first foray into the certified organic community of Montana, which is just a really rad crowd. And we happen to have a few other pioneers of that, organiza or that organization, but also the community here. Um, and when I was 15, and I really wanted to join the Montana Organic Producers Co-op, um, which was this group that allowed small cattle producers to access these really nice markets, mostly selling to Whole Foods in Northern California, but you could have less than a full truckload of cows. Um, and so uh, they needed someone to come and vouch for me, someone to come look at my cows and say, this kid's not gonna sell us a dirty boot, it's gonna be okay. And that someone was Becky Wheat. <laughs> and, that, and she was able to come and again reinforce that this is, this is a group doing things differently. That this is a group that's going to take a 15 year old calling them up seriously who wants to try to be a farmer. Um, I've been repeatedly blessed with folks who are interested in being as, as much of a resource to me as they possibly can be. And that happens to fall both in organic but in Montana. And I think that there's um, some sort of special magic that we just happen to luck upon, and I had luck upon at the right time, the right place. Um, as I've built out my career in farming, it has uh, always come back to that we don't really have time not to be giving of this information and of these resources. And I've never really, I've never really thought about that until this week when I was talking to Emily and thinking about it. And one small anecdote was I took that steer to 4-H when I was nine and the local veterinarian bought it. No one else was bidding, it was a bum cattle market, and he bid it up and he bought it, and when I went to thank him, he said, just so you know, you gotta make sure you're doing this again next year. And that was the first example of someone spending a couple thousand bucks on this nine-year-old and putting themselves out there. And I think that was something that I realized is, how do we all do that or be that for someone else? And looking at how with young people, especially folks who aren't natively in agriculture, who aren't coming from a ranch, who aren't going to be inheriting anything, um, how do we make it so that they feel both welcome and, uh, and have the knowledge and time to, to make a career? Um, I would could jump back to my first mentors, Nancy and Jonda, as uh, the first examples of folks who um, showed me that it was okay to be gay in uh, Montana. And I just married my husband. Um, this and there was a lot of organic folks there. And that just showed how real this community is and the work that we're doing. So thank you. Thanks, Nate. OK, so question round two is focused on how these three are acting as mentors in their lives today. Tim, as a professor, you mentor both undergraduate and grad students. When we camped outside of Haver a couple summers ago before a Montana Organic Association event at Belicus Farms, you were with a grad student. You just visited other central Montana farms on your way there to see research plots and check in with farmers. What does being a mentor mean to you with both your students and also with farmers or others that you work with? I guess my mentorship thinking of it is like engagement. And usually, we live in Bozeman. Bozeman's only 15 minutes from Montana. That was my joke. <laughs> um, 
And so a lot of times we're taking students from MSU who are learning, a lot of them don't have agriculture experience. You're taking them out, you're teaching them about a whole lot of stuff, right? All the way from like, how to drive this forage harvester to how to plant this crop or how to do this, then how to put it in a brown paper bag and weigh it and then you know do the math and statistics and then go out and report and talk to the community that you're working with and it's a really hard serious process that's not all of that easy to do even some of my colleagues they try to be good farmers and i get i'm like i'm not trying to be a good farmer i'm trying to provide nate and latrice with information that's resource relevant and so it's a different mindset in some ways but when i it's it's a process that's not unlike climbing or being mentored in climbing i saw jack tackle floating around here somewhere earlier and i remember when he came to our house in like 1998 to lecture wit and other people about how not to hang on uh, hammered in angles in Highlight Canyon. Um, so that was good. He was a mentor in, in that dangerous. respect. <laughs> 907 West Babcock, the pink house. And he actually walked in there. I can't believe he, yeah. Um, so I, have, I think about mentorship a lot like that. Like it's helping th people through a process or like, and so that's what I, I really like the process and figuring things out and how to work better in sustainable agriculture and make agriculture more sustainable. And so my job is to give that information to these guys and they, they do it. Well, they're, they have to ask me lots of questions too. And Becky too, yeah. So we think a lot about a lot of cool things, but I really like the process and getting students out into the field to learn about agriculture. And a lot of the people who are coming and studying agriculture now don't have farm and ranch backgrounds. They, it's something that they learn and they develop a passion for. It's nothing that's required that you have to come from a farm or ranch background to be involved in agriculture. And I think the agricultural community is welcoming like, and the and MOA, the Organic Association, like Nate said. And it's actually a really cool community of people. Yeah. So Latrice, when my daughter Eloise and I visited you in Browning last summer, you were working with a group of interns. You spent the morning building a research plot in the shape of a medicine wheel, then the afternoon digging soil pits on a ranch against the Rocky Mountain front. The next day you took them, sorry about this pun, to meet groundbreaking organic farmer Bob Quinn in Big Sandy three hours away. Why is it important to you to work with young people like these interns and is there a story you could share that shows this? Uh, yeah, so. For me, it's important to bring the interns and the students that I work with out into the land. I have an intern right there. Please wave, Alicia. <laughs> uh, she's currently a graduate student at MSU now, so so proud of her. Um, but for me, what it was about is giving students the opportunity that I had growing up. Because what I realized is a lot of students, like Tim was saying, don't have the privilege to just go out to land and do things. They don't have the privilege to um, grow up on a ranch. And so for me, when in our culture, we talk about generations and we always um, do the work for the next generation. And so for me, when my dad talks, his grandfather did work on our ranch. My grandmother did work on our ranch and my father did. And so the way I see it is, my kids are benefiting from the work of my grandmother. My dad is benefiting from the work of his great-grandfather. I'm benefiting from the work my great-grandfather and my grandmother did. And so it's a generational responsibility in our culture to make sure in our family that we give people access to land. I remember growing up, my dad would um, take people on horseback trips to the mountains and he would share our stories and share our camping sites and tell us the story behind the mountain and why that mountain was named um, with our uh, cultural leaders. And so having that experience made me more in tune to be like, I, I gotta give back. And so when I started, um, when I graduated with my undergraduate in, from MSU in 2012, I went back and started working on the Blackfeet Nation. And I started working at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And I realized like, okay, this is not, you know, I don't feel like I'm giving back to my community as much. So then I went to work at Blackfeet Community College as the USDA Extension Agent. 
And during that time, I could have had a secretary or I could have hired students. And we had already had um, interns at that time. And I was like, I wanna, I wanna stick with students. Like, I don't need a secretary. Like, I, I could figure this out. I was 25 at the time, you know, like super motivated, thinking I could, you know, take on the world. But it was one of the best things because it was um, really a learning phase for me because when I started, Alicia was already an intern for um, the program, the USDA Extension. And so I come walking into this greenhouse and I remember all these plants growing and I was like, oh my gosh, like I grew up on a cattle farm, like I know how to harvest, you know, these animals. Like I literally know nothing about gardening and planting. And so Alicia doesn't know it, but I was depending on them a lot of, when I first started my position to learn what they were doing and learn how they were planting and all these things. And it took, it took off from there because I built these wonderful relationships with, with my interns. And for me, like it's these lifelong friendships and I get to see them succeeding like in building these friendships. Me and Alicia would sit down at the greenhouse and we would sit in our, my Durango and we'd be talking about our goals and our dreams and we'd be like, oh my gosh, this is what we're gonna do. And I'd be like, yeah, we, and then in 2017, we were both students um, and she was starting her bachelor's degree for psychology and I was starting my master's degree and we were sitting outside my Durango and or at her student house and I was like couch surfing at the time and I was like oh my god Alicia like look this is what we talked about when we were sitting at the greenhouse at BCC and lo and behold now we're sitting in the Durango at MSU and you know we talked our dreams into reality and so for me it was that importance of seeing the positive effect that I could have on people's life just by being there, by building those relationships. Because half the time, somebody just needs someone. And if you're just there to listen, that's really important. And so when I work with my producers, when we're doing these regenerative grazing practices, I don't say, this is what we're gonna do. We sit there with them and we learn about their operation. We learn about who they are as a person. So they build this trust with us. And so they're apt to tell us more about their operation. They're apt to tell us more about the challenges that they're facing. And so when we go to implement these practices and I bring interns um, from Browning High School that I hired from U of M or, you know, we hire students who apply but primarily live um, on the Blackfeet Nation just because of the housing. We don't have a lot of housing there. And so with these students are able to work with these producers and give back. And so what it does is they have this big mis in, uh, misconception of what farming and ranching is. They think these farmers and ranchers just have these big old fancy trucks, these big old, you know, this huge equipment and that, you know, they have tons and tons of money. And when they get to go visit these producers, they start to understand the relationships and some of the challenges that they face. And so what you start to see is these relationships being built between the youth and our agricultural community. And for me, that is really important because they are gonna be the next ones who I always say are, de are decision makers. They're the ones who are gonna be the next professionals. My daughter is 14 and she's like, mom, why don't you hire me for this internship? And I'm like, all right, my girl, like I'll hire you when you're in high school so that, you know, this Fall, she's a freshman, she's like, Mom, when I put in for your internship, like, you gotta hire me, I'm tired of volunteering. I, I know how much your interns get paid, and I'm like, I know, my girl, I know. Like, next year, I promise that I'm not gonna be on the hiring committee because that's nepotism, but if they pick you to work with me, then I'll work with you. And so, you know, it's nice getting to do that work. And then just uh, on Friday, we were working with the Browning High School students and students at the University of Montana installing uh, beaver dam analogs because what we're doing is we're dealing with a lot of climate change in our area. So we're trying to find ways to work with the land. And so what we do is we look at keystone species like the beaver and like the bison and how culturally important they are and the significance roles that they play, not only in our lives, but in, in the ceremonial aspect because our ceremonies are tied so much to the land. Um, every bundle has birds, it has uh, plants, it has all these things that are tied to the land. So in our culture, we are not above or below anything. We are all equal. And so when I talk to people and, and we're dealing with science, I'm like, 
you know, Western science is really linear and it's you want A to B to C why you get to C. And I always say in cultural science, Pakani science, in indigenous science, all these views is very circular because we understand how everything is interconnected. When you have an effect over here, it's gonna ripple effect to all these different um, all these different things. And so that's one thing when we talk to our producers and these ranchers with our in with our youth is we want them to understand that when they're making these decisions that there's always gonna be a cause and effect. And so right now we're trying to work with ways to enhance our lands. We are in uh, the droughtiest drought we can have. Like, i sorry, I just had, a, I got bucked up a horse a couple weeks ago, so I'm still having some memory issues, but I'm still here today. Um, but we're dealing with severe drought and we are at the headwaters of the Rocky Mountain front and in some of those areas you could drive vehicles across the water and so when you take students to see the land in that aspect it's really sad so you have to find ways like how do we mimic these keystone species so mom's like today when we're building a beaver dam analog you guys are beaver when we are putting up these um, solar electric fences you guys are mimicking bison to keep these cattle constantly moving because we deal with a lot of overgrazing up there. So what I try to do with my mentorships is put the relationship back with our youth and our land. And so that's the primary focus when we go out. We get we do soil pits, we dig, we do all these nutrient analysis. But for me, that's not the most important thing that I do. The most important thing that I do is bring these students back on onto the land. So. Nate, you are not active as a mentor right now, but mentorship is a big part of your work through a USDA contract. The agency has 300 million to build and improve markets and income for producers, and 100 million of that is focused on a mentorship program for would-be organic farmers. You're helping facilitate that program. So tell us what exactly are you doing and how is it working? A little math to start out. Um, a really good price for a bushel of wheat for a farmer is about 18 bucks. And you can make 42 loaves of bread from one bushel of wheat. And when we think about how little money is, that is back to the farmer, but really making the farmer's livelihood very doable, thriving. Um, there are so many opportunities for organic farmers, for new farmers, to jump into this market. And, uh, and we just have a lot of kinks in the pipeline making it hard to actually happen. So when uh, USDA, Tom Vilsack, um, and I say this amongst friends, really wanted a do-over from his first term, <laughs> he went hard at organics in the best way. And he's put out a lot of resources um, for trying to figure out how we blow up the organic market, how we blow up the opportunities for new farmers in organics. And one of those was the Organic, uh, organic Transition Initiative, which gave 300 million to technical service providers as well as mentorship um, and a few other pockets. Uh, a big grant just went out for providing um, equipment to organic farmers as well. But the, um, the reason I brought up the loaf of bread and the bushel of wheat price is really that there's so many opportunities for folks to gain access to a market that really treats farmers right. The problem is that uh, farming's cagey, that good farmers who have good markets don't wanna share them. And so I'm through Montana Organic Association and the National Organic Standards Board and a few other groups who are engaged in this work, really trying to just bust down those walls, where who are those buyers who need these product to get it into the mass of consumers, and where are the farmers who want to grow that? And that's uh, a lot easier than you think, because we can just start sharing the names far and wide of who has what markets, and what are those prices, and start thinking about the ability to mentor new farmers into not the same paradigm that we've been struggling under, not the same loss and same uh, struggles that a lot of farmers and ranchers have to undergo, but into a world where you can have a living wage and a respectful, respectable, dignified existence. Um, and that is hopefully going to be the organic market for a lot of new farmers. 
And, uh, and so as we proceed over the next three years, we're going to be hooking up farmers who are farmers who are good organic farmers, respected by their communities. They know how to actually make uh, make a bushel of wheat off their land, as it were, um, and pair them up with aspiring farmers, up to five a year, who are going to then be able to, just as my mentors were to me, call them up with dumb questions all the time until they get a rhythm where they can feel like they can go out on their own. Okay, so this question, I'm gonna just toss it all three of you, and you're gonna have to rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> So the average age of a farmer in the U.S. is 57, and in Montana it's 59. Those stats are from mm -hmm. 2017, and they keep inching upward, so maybe it's 60 now, I don't know. Um, cost of land and capital are high, making it very hard for new people to enter the field. So this is sort of a two-part question. What other barriers to entry and challenges are there that you see or encountered? And what strains do we have in Montana and in the Northwest that could help us address these challenges? What in Bozeman might we lean on benefit all of Montana? Do you have a good answer, Nate? I don't have a, like, it's a very encompassing question. Well, so what other challenges other than cost of land and capital are there? Yeah. How hard is it to do this? Yeah. Um, I went to MSU and got a, I had a really good time getting a soil science degree, but never did I have a class that taught me really what a combine was. Like I left that program still like bewildered as to how does this magic machine turn a standing field of wheat into grain in a bin. And I think a lot of that is very active mentorship. It's that we don't have a good pipeline through academia right now through technical trades that are just teaching the most basic fundamental pieces because we assume most kids who are going to become farmers come from farms. And that information is not going to be necessary to be passed on in a formal program. Um, and so I think that's a huge component is a really a fair and again dignified opportunity to go through a mentorship program, be it an apprenticeship or a trades program where you're able to actually learn all of the pieces to farming necessary to run an entire operation before you're expected to go seek out land and try this on your own. Latrice, you talked about climate change and that you're seeing it right now. Might that also be a growing barrier challenge as we try to feed ourselves? It is, especially in our country. We have a lot of prairie potholes, a lot of kettles, a lot of natural springs and so what we're seeing is the depletion of our groundwaters and so when we're seeing the depletion of our groundwaters our surface waters are being severely impacted and so that's kind of one of the biggest challenges uh, where we live is primarily agriculture country that's the um, biggest revenue source for for people in our area and so when you have the lack of water what ends up happening uh, we have vast grasslands, is that people aren't able to utilize all of their pastures. And so in doing that, we have a lot of overgrazing, and so that is putting more pressure on our lands. And so we're starting to see a lot of our um, native plants take a, a huge impact. And last year with the drought, we it was so severe, a lot of our traditionalists who are berry pickers couldn't pick berries because there was no berries up there. A lot of the elders for a ceremony who pick sweet grass, a lot of those wetlands were so dry, there was no sweet grass in where the animals were because it's a palatable plant and it had a lot of moisture. All the livestock and the cattle were hitting it extremely hard and so that is one of the impacts that we're seeing is the effects of climate. And when we, like I was saying before, when we are trying to replicate what um, the keystone species did on the land, is we're trying to bring back some of those ecological functions back to those ecosystems. And we are starting to see benefits to that. We, and last year, put out our first snow fence and how we did that is 
we are fortunate enough to live um, in our traditional territory. So I was like, we're gonna go look at some teepee rings interns. We are gonna measure those teepee rings and those teepee rings are gonna tell us our predominant wind directions. Mm -hmm. And so when you know these, we're gonna go build a snow fence. And so most snow fences that you see are just straight. Um, and what my interns did is they designed a snow fence that was a semicircle, And it captured the areas where the rock cairns were the thickest on the teepee rings because those showed the predominant wind directions. Mm -hmm. So our predominant wind direction in our areas comes from the southwest wind dire uh, direction and that's where we had about almost five feet of uh, rocks piled out mm -hmm. and so taking in that cultural knowledge when we are implementing these practices really ties into that relationship to the students of like putting that identity back to place like oh you know these were our ancestors who were building these rocks and when we talk about soil erosion I'm like students think about it these rocks they're like about a foot big a foot high and all of those rocks are now in, in the ground I was like do you think that's erosion that they're dealing with? All these different factors um, within these different ecosystems. I was like, you know, these these rock cairns and these teepee rings could tell us something more. We just gotta be wise enough to to look at them and see what the stories they're telling. And so, you know, we could look back at the um, dirt, the dust bowl, and all these things. And so, for me, it's that application of really looking at the lo the um, story the land is telling, and in our culture we always learn from the land we always learn from the animals they always took pity on us because we as humans were the pitiful ones and so the elders always talk and when we um go to to listen to them you know you have to bring an offering and they were like you know at one time the four-legged took care of the two-legged and now it's time for the two-legged to take care of the four-legged and so it's switching the responsibility of care and so those are the things you share with the youth because it's those stories that have been passed down from time into time immemorial that t tie us to place, tie us to land. And so those things are important because we have stories where we talked about at one time it was extreme heat. We have those stories that tie us back to land and those things. So it's just going back to our knowledge base, our cultural knowledge base to be our, our guide when we're, we are going through these different things. So for me, it's always going back to my culture and who I am as a person when we're dealing with these difficult things um, agriculturally. So we are about to open up Q&A from the audience. Um, but I just wanna go back to the land again. So many of you spent the morning being intimate with the land, whether you were farming or fishing or cycling or climbing. Um, it's really important to all of us. I know in the winter I always sort of feel sick when I don't have my hand in the garden and it cracks. So it's really pretty important, I think. We're animals after all. Um, so I'd love to hear from the three of you. Why is it important that we spend time close to the earth and close to the land? we're part of it. I mean, right? We can't view ourselves as any anthrocentric part of the world. Mm -hmm. So we live inside this ecosystem that what Latrice just very eloquently described, right? And so we're not any separate from the land. So all our agricultural practices have to be worked through thinking of the ecology, the systems and everything else like that. And if you're not out there and you don't know and understand and you know, it's not like I actually was just at a meeting where someone reported about um, people's perceptions of agriculture, whether it's traditional ecological agriculture, small grain agriculture, you know, ranching, farm, anything. And they asked people who worked in the field and they asked people who were in the general public what their perceptions of agriculture were. And people who worked in the field commented on complexity, difficult decision making, knowledge intensive, all these things like that. And the general public said, ah, it's pretty easy. It's hard work. It's a little risky and that's it. Like I have the picture of the slide in my pocket and I just like 
I just remember, sat back and I was completely shocked because so many of all this agriculture, all our food has such complex knowledge that's involved in producing it, passed down for multiple generations. You know, when we think about, if we think about wheat, if we think about corn, if we think about rice, they're all annual grasses. You guys can come take my nerdy plant class if you want. <laughs> but what Latrice is talking about is a system of perennial agriculture that was traditional ecological in Blackfoot system, in the Blackfeet system, right? And it's something that's a little bit, it's, it's different in that way, but it's still the same way involved in producing food. But the cool part is she gets to have a perennial plant cover on the top of her grass, <laughs> on the top of the soil to protect it. And there's a part that brings in the animals too, right? It's these very complex interactions of ecology and life that we just can't pretend that we're anthrocentric in. Nate, why is it important you to spend time outside on the land? I don't know who I, I should attribute this to, but I've heard that weather always looks worse through a window. <laughs> and so as you're thinking about all of the different challenges we have as a community, as a society, um, being close to the land addresses so many of those in one fell swoop. And as a farmer, I'm always looking for efficiencies. So when I'm thinking about how do I raise healthy young bodies for my niece and nephew, being out on the land is one way for them to understand both the story and the value of their food, but also that their own expenditure of calories is some way to experience a lot of endorphins and be able to live a life where they are having just these high off the most simple pleasures and looking at how we fundamentally understand our landscape. One stat that I would throw out for you all to chew on is that every time you see a field of alfalfa in this valley, it is drinking 325,000 gallons of water every year, every acre, every year. And so when we look to who's using a lot of water, it's alfalfa and you can't, you know, I would say you can't blame anyone for that other than we haven't taken up the challenge of growing something better on that land. And every farmer who's growing alfalfa would love to grow something much more valuable, much more exciting, much more nutritious than just some cattle feed. And we just haven't quite figured out how we're going to make that happen here. But what an opportunity. But alfalfa does outcompete Canada this week. <laughs> Tim and I love alfalfa in a rotation. <laughs> Why is it important to you to spend time on the land? I guess for me, spending time on the land, it's that relationship, right? We all have that relationship to the land. When we go out there, we sit by the creek and we watch the birds fly. We watch the river flow. We watch the grass blow in the wind. It does something for us. It does something for our spirit. And so it's that connectivity when now when you're learning about people in, in depression, they're starting to take them away from medication and they're saying, go spend some time in nature, go listen to the sounds, you know, get away from all the things that bring you anxiety. Like, and so it's about that connection of knowing like we are from nature, we, we, we gotta be a part of it in a lot of those ways. And so for me, being out on the land and having that connection helps me be a better decision maker. And so knowing natural systems and getting to see the mountains in the most natural state from nine all the way up until I brought all my kids back um, during Thanksgiving, I was like, guess what? Y'all are getting to do what mom got to do. Like we're gonna, we're gonna freeze up here and warm up our turkey on the fire, you know, our mashed potatoes and everything. Like this is living, um, but it is, it's, it's bringing people out there and, and harnessing those relationships because once you're out there, you're doing things, you're, you're muddling around. And, and my kids got their first um, kill with their papa. And for them, that was really something really big because they hunted with their papa. They um, cleaned the animal and we ate fresh heart. And so I was telling them, I was like, you know, this is some food sustainability, some food sovereignty. We know where this animal come from. We know how it was processed, how it was handled. And you know, in that, we always give an offering. Um, I forgot to mention that before, but before I take my interns out to dig a soil pit, before I take my interns out to clip any type of grass sample, we go put tobacco out. 
and we thank the land for providing these resources and for taking something from it because we're literally taking something from the land and so in our culture we always got to give something back before we take and so it's always important to remember those relationships are reciprocal because whether it's food that is growing from the land that we're taking we always got to give something back to thank the land for providing for us so for me it's always remembering those relationship and, and you know it's almost like caring for our mother because you know in our culture we um, view this as mother earth and so in in that way it's just you know taking care of the ways you would honor your mother